Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, just type in if you're okay and see us. We are joined today by Dr. Ian Renshaw, all the way from Queensland, Australia, who's in their winter months right now. So, uh, Dr. Renshaw, give us give us a little bit. Uh, firstly, thanks for joining us, number one. And number two, give us a little bit about your journey and your background and how you got to where you are now. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. Um, Okay, so um, my journey started um, in North Nottinghamshire when, when I was a kid. Um, and I was a, my dad was a sort of semi pro footballer briefly. Um, and so obviously I became, I tried to become a footballer, but didn't really make it. Um, very late developer, which was quite interesting. At 14, I was tiny, everybody else had got beards and it was huge. Um, so my teachers sort of said, well, you, you have a lot of skill, but you just need to grow. But by then, as you know, you get picked up at 14, 15 and, or you miss it. So I never, never went anywhere and then really gave up with it um, and went into cricket and badminton, actually. Um, really got stuck into those sports, did pretty OK at cricket um, and then did my uni, well, went to uni in Leeds, did a human movement degree. Um, at Carnegie, which leads leads up in Headingley, North Leeds, um, and then finished that, and then went and did a post grad in teaching and PE teaching at Loughborough Uni. So that's where I got exposed to um, Rob Thorpe, Dave Bunker, people like that in terms of games for understanding or um, game sense, as I think you might call it. Um, then went and taught PE for four years in a sub suburb of Middlesbrough, really nice place. The uh, the views were incredible. Um, we were on the edge of the North Yorkshire Moors, so if it ever got slightly boring, you could just look at the views, which were fabulous. Uh, so taught there for four years, taught, coached the football, the rugby, the basketball, the, the usual PE role in, in England. Um, and I really got into coaching a lot of rugby. Uh, football was interesting because the kids in middle just thought they knew everything. <laughs> so it's difficult to teach them, whereas rugby was, they didn't know anything. So it was much more fun in a lot of ways to teach. Um, so then moved across to Teesside Polytechnic, as it was then, a Teesside Uni now, um, and was working um, in the fitness area, the, the gyms, coaching the rugby team, the cricket team. Uh, we set up some high performance groups in squash and bad badminton. Um, and then the sports science degrees came on about 1995. And I did a master's degree in coaching in Edinburgh one day a week for three years with John Lyle. Um, and then ended up teaching all the, the coaching units on the, on the degree. Um, and then on to motor skill. So a friend left and I took over all the motor skill stuff. Um, and then started my PhD there and then moved to Sheffield and finished my PhD um, under Keith Davids in, in Sheffield. Um, it was on cricket, so I guess that's not <laughs> really relevant for an American audience too much. Um, and then spent only spent a couple of years there and somebody put a job on my desk to go to Auckland in charge of the coaching um, uni, uh, coaching stream at the university in Auckland. Um, so I went there for four years. Um, and then moved on to Brisbane. So and I've been in Brisbane since 2007. Um, interesting coaching. Well, I'd always coach from, from being sort of 18, well, 17, 18, you sort of get a default job as a coach. Um, um, and then when I got to New Zealand, my, my little one was um, seven or eight and I'd been, he'd been playing all sorts of sports in Sheffield and we got there and um, he ended up playing football, obviously. And I ended up coaching the coaching the, the eight year olds. And that's really interesting in a culture where they don't really understand football. It's like it was great. It was back to the, the equivalent of rugby in England, you know, like you 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 were teaching kids who didn't even if you if you said to them go wide, they looked at you as though they didn't know clue what you were talking about, which was a good learning for me, especially for eight year olds. Um so I learned a hell of a lot from from coaching them. Then we moved on to another club and I wasn't allowed to coach Matthew because he was in the A team, as it were. Um, so dads weren't allowed to do that. So I ended up coaching the under 17s, which was good fun. Again, that's the first time I'd gone back to coaching 11 aside after sixes and eights and, and all, so on and so on. So um, really interesting experience when the, the head coach, German, very keen on winning. 
um, but very keen on development as well. So you've got to win, but I'm going to give you 16 kids and everybody needs to have a game, and et cetera, et cetera, which was absolutely no problem. But the challenge was then managing parents um, yeah. in terms of winning and everybody getting a fair go and everything. So, um, yeah, then moved on to to um, to Australia. Um, as you said, we're, we're just coming to summer, but winter's a summer here anyway. So um, my son did his knee and wasn't allowed to play football again. So he's he sort of ended and I went and played over 50 or over 40s or over 50s football, which was great fun uh, for a few years until the body gave out. Um, but really coach, didn't, didn't go back to coaching football then, but um, do a lot of it um, within our work with students at QUT. We, we have an exercise science group and um, they call it HPE, Health and Physical Education. So training PE teachers um, is part of my brief and I now do all the skill acquisition for them. Um, so which is, we obviously have got a very different approach to coaching, um, which they find challenging because they come from a very traditional background. We know 95% of them have been trained by drill um, warm-up drill little game at the end if you're lucky and then that's it uh, so when we come in with a completely different angle it, it's some of them it's a bit of a shock but I think the key thing they they work out is that you've got to cater for everybody and they've been successful products of that system but we know that 70% of the kids can't stand PE because it doesn't meet their needs on a psychological level and then when they realize that they have to adapt so that they you know, every kid can be challenged, whether they're brilliant or whether they're not so good. Um, that really sort of turns the light bulbs on for a lot of them. Um, and it's just more fun, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Play games, it's more fun than standing in line and doing a drill. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, that's, yeah. that's a quite a rich journey there. And mm. obviously, you know, we can, we can unpick some of those things and I can ask you some questions on that. And, uh, you know, obviously you talked about coaching Matthew when he was eight yeah. Yeah. Um, in New Zealand. What was the, uh, what was the size of, of the pitches? Uh, was, it, was it like a 4v4, 5v5? Was it right, so it was 6v6 to start with. Yeah. Um, on, and it started off on a quarter of the field. Yeah. Um, the coach was allowed on the field, which was okay. interesting. Um, no goalkeepers, yeah. which was which was very interesting, but the goals were quite small. Yeah. But um, it, it, what was interesting was that if you stood in front of the goal, as you might think, if you don't want somebody to score, you might stand in front of the goal. Um, some of the opposition coaches were, you're, you're playing with a goal league. And well, where do you want us to do? Stand and leave the goal wide open. But, um, but that was interesting. It was on a quarter of a pitch. It was, it was a bit beehive at times. It was a bit... Um, you know, one or two players would dominate, really. But um, it's interesting, though, for our team that we had two really good ones, two middle ones, and two that were not so good. Yeah. Um, and we played the, the, the team that we played that, that hadn't been beaten since they were five, you know. <laughs> um, and we beat them in a, in, in a game. And they was held on by the opposition parents because they felt as though their coach had not coached them, you know, because... Um, but what the difference was in the game was the two the two weaker kids. Yeah. One scored a hat trick, um, and one saved you know saved a, a goal on the line at the end, and uh, that was the difference because everybody else cancelled each other out. So I always think that the your strong as your weakest player. Yeah. Um, so that was something I within the coaching that we did, it, it you know it seemed to allow them to develop at their own rate. Yeah. It was a really interesting experience at the end of the year because you had to give awards out and, uh, you know, everybody everybody had to have a prize, which is, but they wanted best player, most improved, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I just, well, I'm not doing that. They said, well, what do you mean? I said, I'm giving six most improves. And they just looked at me as I was mad because basically I, my view was if I've not made everybody better, then the new I've job. done my job, yeah. and and we know who the best. You know, like everybody knows who the best one is. It's and everybody knows who the ones are the weakest. So what's the point reinforcing that at eight? Um, so the the year after was interesting because it was still six aside, but we went and played other clubs. So the the first 
year was within the club. Yeah. So there's enough teams there you could, in the age group. There's sort of eight teams in the in the age group. And then the year after we went and played other clubs and they played on a half size field then. But still, okay. it might have been seven actually. It might have been seven a side because I think they had a goalie there. Yeah. But the pitches were so big that it was just silly, you know. Yeah. And I mean, we played on, you get this coming from England, it was a place called Birkenhead, which yeah. immediately sent shivers through me thinking of Liverpool. But, um, it was a huge field. It must have been the size of Wembley. And within five minutes of the game, the game had split up into three at the back, three at the front, and it just a boot down the middle. And those three played against each other there. And then yeah. it booted back. And, and I just said to Pete, I said, if you want to scout for cross country, this is your, this is your, your, your venue. But if you want to find footballers, forget it. Yeah. You know, yeah. not develop footballers really. Def defend for twenty minutes, attack for twenty minutes, and then. Well, it's the usual. What you know, the, yeah. the biggest danger is for you was when you won a corner. Yeah. Because the corner flag was so far away, you couldn't <laughs> cross it in, and it got intercepted, and they flew away. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, we it was really interesting that, that yeah. and we've done quite a bit of work since uh, in our work on pitch sizes and um, trying to scale for what yeah. children can do rather than on expediency I guess you know yeah. it's easy just to throw some cones down and divide it into a, half a field yeah. but that has a massive impact depending on this the size of the field in the first place so yeah absolutely I think um I think most of the world is actually done a, a better job now of making the the pitches appropriate to the age and stage of development yeah. that the players are in and, yeah. and stuff like that it's it's really interesting though isn't it about when childhood ends and we need to go to the full yeah. game though yeah. um, in a lot of sport not just in football at 12 they seem to go to the full size pitch because yeah. now we've got to play the proper game it's too and early it's still so far different to the real yeah. game you know yeah. so we did we did um I did some work in netball, which I don't, I don't know whether you know. Yep. I know what netball is. Basketball yeah. without the dribble for the Americans. Yeah, in the exactly. Simple as yeah. that. And, and without we, the backboard. Without the backboard. So, <laughs> yeah. um, and we looked at the, in the adult game, they can get the ball from under their hoop to, to the opposition hoop in three passes. And that's the, the rules that basically mean that there has to be a minimum of three. Yeah. But we got 12 year olds to do it. And, you know, just passing it, it took five passes you know, for 12 year olds to get it with their maximum pass. So you're getting a completely different game. So it's not the same game. And tactically, it's not the same game. In, in basketball, we got, um, we tried to look at the hand size of the, the in ratio to the ball. The ball we, yeah. we took some adults and then for a side, you know, a full size ball. And then we tried to create the same ratio for 12 year old boys. And it was a size four, five at absolute best, but they were still using sevens, you know, yeah. by the full size ball. But what happens is then you couldn't shoot the three pointer. Well, the kids in Australia couldn't yeah. shoot the three pointer. So you get this sort of condensing beehive around the hoop because they don't need to come out and defend further out because nobody can yeah. score from that far. And they know that yeah. as soon as we gave them a small ball, there were three, three point attempts then. So now the defense has to come out that creates space inside. So it's just little things like that, isn't it? Of, of being yeah. aware that you change one little thing and it changes the whole picture. Yeah. Now, did you with the with the basketball, Ian? Did they reduce the height of the well, that, basket that's, too? And the... again, that's something that we would strongly sort of recommend, isn't it? Um, but again, it's experience. It's the structure of the facility and the, the capacity yeah. to re reduce the hoops. Um, I mean, again, it, if you think about the height of your NBA players and the height yeah. of the hoop, um, and look at that as a ratio. So, you know, there might be this much difference between your hand at the top and the hoop, so they can just yeah. go plop. Yeah. Those little kids are down here, and it's massive. So we have to we have to create the same scale, the same ratio based on their height. And so yeah. if we want dunking for an eight-year-old, you know, 10-year-old, then yeah. you've got to make the hoop lower. But you know, yeah. people go, oh, no, we can't do that. Well, why not? That's the game. That is the game, yeah. Yeah, if you want those skills to de develop and the tactics, you know, from the word go, then scale it to what the kids can, can do and are capable of. Yeah. yeah. Have, have, you, uh, have you seen the, the little video that the FA put out? Um, I think US hockey or Canadian hockey did the same thing. Yeah. So they put yeah. the children 
they put the yeah. adults on what it feels like. So I just thought yeah. that's a great picture. And I'll share that with our audience after as well. So um, I think there's one of my former students is on that. <laughs> yeah. He's brilliant. on the video. Um, and then one of my heroes growing up, not growing up, yeah. but uh, Steve Hodge was a yeah. forest player. Forest, he, big time forest yeah. player. Yeah, he was on there. Um, so but it's absolutely right, isn't it? And, yeah. and that's, that's a good example of how silly it is, really. But I mean, for me, that it, it, we, this is where we have to get administrators involved in the design because all fields really are designed for adults and then adapted for children. Yeah. Well, why? If, but the majority of the sport really is played by the kids. Yeah. So why don't we design, you know, purpose purpose design junior facilities with different size pitches so that they can scale up to it as they as they get bigger? But I mean, that's a political issue i guess as much it as is as it is to it. some degree but when you look at the belgian fa and what they did brilliant you yeah. know so they yeah. went from 65 to number one in the world by yeah. changing the model at the at the at the foundation mm -hmm. and you know and i know chris van der hagen had trouble selling it at first to parents right and getting the yeah. buy-in but yeah it took it took you know it, it took them getting knocked out of the 2000 i think euros which mm. they hosted and the Dutch went on to the semis, but you know, it took that, uh, you know, travesty. Failure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it, you know, but, uh, you know, like we tell, tell all our children that we work with to fail is the first attempt in learning. Keep making Absolutely. those stepping stones. But it's then just we, reframe it as exploring, isn't it? Yeah. Exploring. Trying to find a way that works. You try yeah. to find a way that works. And sometimes yeah. it doesn't, sometimes it does. Yeah. You know, and, and at the elite level, you might spend, if you're a winger, you might spend the first 10 minutes trying different tricks on your fullback to get past it and then or her, and then <clears throat> then you find it and then you exploit it. You know, you, yeah. you find the weakness and then you exploit it over and over again if you can. But yeah. um, I, it, it's a real interesting challenge, isn't it? I, I, one of our epiphanies for students is working it out that 1v0 can be a game. Or yeah. one one can be a game. You know, they think they've got to have, you know, a whole team before you can have a game. But you'd have played. You, you know, when you were growing up, I don't know about Birmingham. It's a bit dodgy. Yeah. In the, uh, <laughs> well, I was uh, in the nice part. I was in Solihull. Oh, yeah. So oh, Solihull. <laughs> Solihull. So um, now you know. <laughs> but, you, so, but you'd have played on your own on the on the street. You know, kids just playing a game against the wall or yeah. or whatever, and, and creating. You know, smashing it against the wall and then diving if you if it was grass or whatever and just making your own games up yeah. and then 1v1 games or 2v1v1v1 one v, one v one, you know on the field um so getting our students to understand that you can design those games and that's where the individual skills can emerge <clears throat> in in those much smaller sided games where you get loads of touches um there's nobody standing over you telling you how to do it you're just working it out aren't you but yeah. and as a coach it's promoting that and, and providing that environment for, for kids to learn and, and our whole approach has been sort of said well well you, you just let them play no you don't you, the, yeah. the work is in the design you know what you want but it matching it to the needs of the kids at that that moment in time i think the skill yeah yeah i think that is the true skill though isn't it is it, and and i think part yeah. of that is dr renshaw is actually knowing who's in front of you knowing the kid the children that are in front of yeah. you and knowing yeah. what it is that they need um, and working, uh, co-creating with them, you know, yeah. Completely. activities and solutions to yeah. to the potential problems. I think, you know, but it <clears throat> takes a, a certain amount of uh, investment in time, but also getting to know them as a person as opposed to just the player. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, one of the, I think one of the biggest learning, oh, sorry, I've got a dog. That's here. okay. <laughs> um, one of the biggest learnings I had was one night in Auckland where I took my son down for training and it had rained in the day, which is part of the course in Auckland, but the parents thought that training would be off. And one other boy turned up and, and he's I'm calling, calling John, uh, yeah. but he wasn't, he was a real timid young boy, um, very shy. And I, the two of them, I thought, well, I'm here now, we're going to do something. Um, and I had to design games to meet the needs of both of them. 
you know, so you, you had to adapt it so that they could all both of them achieve. So we made games of where the rules for one were different to the rules for the other. Yeah. It's not like you would have done in backyard games. And he was the boy who's you know won as the game in that in that game. Um, and I, he, we saw him at a cricket game about two years later. He's brought up, he's brought up by his grandma, um, and she said he still talks about that night. He still he just remembers it. It's so powerful for him. Because yeah. I guess maybe the first time somebody's paid him some attention and and actually cared about his game. But for me, the the kick thing was learn was just helping him learn to kick the ball. You know, just we played a kicking game where you you got a goal, um, and he got to kick it through quite um, a big goal. So and, and Matthew had to defend quite a small, sorry, the other way around. So yeah. Matthew had to kick into a small goal. So um, yeah. John yeah. had the small goal to defend, and then Matthew had a huge goal to defend because Stephen wasn't as accurate with his kicking, and I just wanted him, you know, in step kicking and kick, kick as hard yeah. as he can. Um, and the rule was basically one to stop it, two to move it, three to kick it back. And then I brought in a like a little boundary five meters from the goal line. If you control it within that line, you get your second and your third. If not, yeah. you just have to pass it back. You can't score. And he, he just developed his kicking ability from that. Yeah. Um, but for Matthew, it was stretching him by going, right, you've got to control with, with your right on the inside. Uh, move it with the outside of your left, kick it with your right, and so on. You know, just yeah. you can never have the same combination. So you've always got to do one left, one right, yeah. control right, left, in, yeah. inside, and outside, and all of that sort of stuff. Whereas for Stephen, it was just stop it, move it, kick it. Yeah. You know, um, so that was that was a really good learning for me, I think. Um, a lot of the games I still do now with the students was from that night. You know? Yeah. And they work at all levels, they work with elite players as well as, as little juniors brilliant brilliant and uh you know i just just thinking about that just um i remember going through my teaching and you know we always re we would always remember the the upper the elite athlete we would yeah. always remember the ones at, who struggled and then yeah. often you know where the biggest gap was in the middle and they were the ones that were left behind sometimes because we were either catering to the the higher yeah. end or catering yeah. to the lower end um but uh you know i mean that's where that's where i started to think and go well differentiation right how can we differentiate yeah. by task outcome or process you know how how do you know and that goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago about knowing who's in front of you right so yeah. now you know by knowing Stephen, you knew that this is what he needed to work on you also were able to stretch matthew um, and keep Matthew engaged, um, yeah. you know, um, did you ever, that evening, was there ever like, oh, dad, it's not fair because my goal is so big or it was no, just, I, uh, I think he knew what I was doing, you know, because yeah. we, we'd always, I mean, it, all his sport, really, whatever sport it was, was the, the training with the team was the social aspect and learning to work with others, but the skill learning was always done with me. Yeah. You know, whichever sport that we played at, really. And we, we would go and play games on the field of football, you know. So yeah. um, we'd take two balls and we'd go, a warm up would be um, football bowls, or, you know, like, so I'd kick a ball, he had to hit the ball. Yeah. If he hit the ball, then he got to kick it. So we'd yeah. just run, a, you know, we'd wander around the field. Doing over, that yeah. sort of thing. And then we'd just marbles. play. Yeah, soccer marbles. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's actually a better way of writing yeah. and saying it. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll steal that now. You can, uh, yeah, you can. Thank you. Um, but he, no, he knew he, he he was he was knowledgeable enough, I think, in his yeah. own to know what I was doing. Yeah. You know, and if he if we didn't, he would we would have to go home anyway, and he'd, he'd rather have been there playing. But, yeah. But an interesting one I did was um, like it was one v one, but um, it was there was goals were one meter apart in. Uh, with little cones in a triangle mm -hmm. so it was a 10 meter triangle like basically equilateral triangle and each of the corners was a little goal um, and you had to dribble it you, you had to try and dribble it through the cone every time you dribble it through a cone you got a point and you could go in from the front you could go in from the back yeah. um, the only rule was you weren't allowed to go back to that cone until you'd gone to one of the others so it's interesting there's always two choices so 
you then start to you know fake one way and then go into the other but interesting when they had a change of fee you know if you lost the ball you learn you went quickly so you went quickly away from your opponent so some of those little principles of play came out beautifully in in those sort of games um and we you know matthew modified his behavior that he wasn't crunching him and, uh, so he learned to feel the pressure of somebody up on him but wasn't about those horrible ones I used to hate as a kid where you've got one in one v one in a 10 meter grid yeah. and you can't get past them because it's, it's you know it's just impossible with my skill level it was impossible <laughs> yeah uh, but now you've got a choice here and then with later on I developed a game with the six of them it, it actually works better with eight um where it's two teams of four mm -hmm. um but we play four one v ones in the in the game and we we do it in a 20 v 20 meter box and my goal is on one side of the so it's you're basically playing diagonal yeah so across the square and then there's another game going there and another game so you're playing all four games are in the same square but now you've got to try and get past them to get to get uh, yeah your goal and you can vary the rule you can say you've got to get over the line and stop it or you can kick it through um, but what we do with that is that so my team are playing your team and I play you to start with and we have a two minute game and you you smash me five nil or whatever so you get a point but my mate's playing you next so I have to brief him on what you've got and what you can do um, and it, it's really good to make then people think well look he hasn't got he's all left footed or he's all right footed yeah. make sure he goes that way but because of the the messiness of the environment that problem of not being able to get past them isn't necessarily there because you can use other bodies to you know like yeah. screening almost in basketball we used to use that as a screen and go around there and i did this at a, a tgfu conference in um, in loughborough in about 20 maybe 2014 or 2012 2011 i think um and i did it with the adults and nick levitt was there yeah. from the fa, FA yeah. yeah he's been a guest on the the web yeah too. And one of the other guys from the FA, and and we played the game, and at, and at the end of it, I said, well, what did your teammate tell you? Did it help? And there's a Swedish guy there. I said, no, it wasn't what my teammate told me, but what my opponent told his teammate, and he just said, play on his left foot. He hasn't got, he hasn't got a left foot whatsoever. So he block his right off. He's got nowhere. And so then they started being innovative, trying to solve the solution. So he's trying to like scoop it over the defender yeah. to bounce it in and then moving it in a gap and, and shooting through between people. And I said to Nick, I said, would, would you would you be happy that? I said, yeah, you're learning a penetrative pass. Yeah. You know, you're learning to pick a gap between defenders. And I thought, well, I didn't. So some of these games, you don't know what's going to emerge. Yeah. Um, and the, the strategies that they use are really clever um, and, and not imposed upon them so that allows them to find their own best way and of course you'd be clever enough to match you know match teams a, a little bit if you want if you had a big group um, you wouldn't necessarily put the weakest with the strongest you'd match them in terms of the challenge yeah but, um, but that's I a, that. I mean, it's a do lovely you, game it's a communication do you, have, game. do you have that drawn out do you have that in a um, uh, i've got it on it i've got it a little bit it's actually in a paper um we did a paper talking about motivation and constraints yeah. um, in 2012, and I can send you that. Yeah, brilliant, and I can share that with our audience. Yeah. Because one of the things we wanted to try and demonstrate was that the, the approach um, is intrinsically, I was gonna say intrinsically motivating yeah. in terms of the approach, but it meets those psychological needs of being able to demonstrate competence being able to make decisions have some autonomy but also some relatedness of yeah. being connected yeah. to your teammates and it also changes the relationship between the coach and the player rather than the coach you know having the power and telling them all the solutions they they work the solutions out for themselves and that's incredibly powerful yeah like what you do is you play one v one in round one so everybody plays each other it works it can work with four it can work with three actually um so you go one v one um one team wins the round or it's a draw so you get one point for the win yeah. you then go two v two 
So you go 2v2 across and 2v2 that way. Yeah. So And each of the pairs play against each other. You get, you get one point for winning it or um, a draw or whatever. Um, and then in the third round, it's 4v4. Yeah, 4v1v1. Um, one you one. lost the first two rounds, so you're 2-0 down. Yeah. The beauty is that the third round is is worth two points. So you can yeah. come back and get a draw. Yeah. Um, so you still keep playing. And then if you come back and get 2-2, two, two, you've got to have a playoff. So. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So we, I do something a little bit similar. So we'll have two pitches um, and there's a like a five-yard gap in between. And yeah. even though it's two games going on, the, the scores are aggregates, so they're combined. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. if the ball goes out, this player can leave and go and join the game. But then you could leave your team short, but you're up by a player on the other side. So, yeah, again, yeah. very similar, but different mm. because it's not as uh, not as dynamic, obviously, as the 1v1, 2v2. So I, I'm, I'm going to steal that one. Um, and I've heard yeah. you, I think I, I heard you talk about this with Stuart Armstrong, I think, um, when you did the talent equation podcast yes um so i'm gonna have to look at the pictures um all right yeah. I, I, is it uh what's his name uh dr richard bailey talks about learning styles there is no learning styles i'm, I'm a visual learner <laughs> so I, I will i could learn better by actually seeing and, and then doing so oh, yeah 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 by doing it yeah by doing yeah by doing so it's it's funny right so um I'm currently, I did my UEFA B some years ago at Lily Shaw um, uh, when Craig Simmons was in and he was working on the four corner model and everything. And then uh, I decided to do my USSFB license um, because I need that to go on and become a grassroots instructor. And they've changed the game over here at the grassroots level. They're doing a lot of uh, play practice play or whole part whole, a little yeah, bit yeah. similar. Um, at the, at the grassroots, at the younger ages, so under six, under eight, under 10, they want everything in the play practice play model. Now, going and doing my B license, the way the methodology they're using is a methodology that they call OLLI or WALLY. So it's warm up, orientation. The orientation phase, we're setting the problem for the focus team and we're working with the opponent. And then in the learning phase, we're working with the, with the focus team to solve the problem that the opponent created and then in implementation, we're just doing a lot of observation to see if player behavior is changing. So, right. you know, not too dissimilar. Obviously, this is the methodology the Federation's um, using. But hearing you talk about the 1v0, the 1v1, the, this four times 1v1, but also talking about taking notice. Well, what does your opponent do? What is the game giving you? What is, yeah. you know, these are the things that I think are missing, right? And I think yeah. within coaching and teaching, we are so quick to give the answer that we take yeah, away yeah. the opportunity for the yeah. for the students to learn, right? Because we want to, yeah. you know, I show think, what we know. I think one of the things that we we've, we've talked about um, is reframing skill um, from acquisition, you know, where we acquire a motor program in our brain that we then run off, which means that we have to do three million or ten thousand hours of practice to get yeah. that. We won't go there. Yeah. Um, um, in terms of skill adaptability, so it's about being able to adapt to your environment um, and whatever the sport, you've got to find a way. You've got to you've got to explore. You've got to come up with a solution that is the best for you at that moment in time. Yeah. Now, it might not be good enough. You know, like that. That's the point about when you, if you go into a competition and you don't know the quality of the opposition, you can be completely outranked or you can be you can smash them and then it's yeah. not much learning for anybody but um it's about exploring and finding the solution like if you were one-on-one -on -one, what is the weakness of this opponent and then once you've got that you've searched you've explored and that will mean failure you, you know yeah. like sometimes it might not work you, you might knock it between the legs and they just turn and take it or, you know or whatever but when you find the, the best solution for you then you exploit it yeah. And that's learning across whichever sport um, you, you've got to export. And at the highest level, it's finding those weaknesses. But that means understanding the principles of play. And I think yeah. that's the other thing that, that sports don't get across to their coaches well enough, is understanding the principles of play. So, you know, we're playing a formation, but well, what does that mean? You know, yeah. um, the, the German coach I worked with in New Zealand was, was brilliant. I think he was very high level coach. 
I mean, he was quite simple. We want more of our players around the ball than theirs. Yeah. You know, whether we've got the ball or whether they've got the ball. And, you, and that way, you've always got one man over or one woman over, you know, which is simple. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. but this that principle, of, you know, one of the basic foundation principles of invasion games. Yeah. Uh, but do we do we get people to understand that? No, we're, yeah. we're, we're teaching, you know, how to kick a ball with the inside of the foot away. Yeah, so really, really interesting there, right? So I wonder, you know, if Messi had been in England, where, whether Messi would have, you know, got to no, who he was, no. right? And then the other thing, the other thing that comes to mind is in the 2002 World Cup, Ronaldo scored eight goals in the World Cup, the original Ronaldo, not Cristiano, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for Brazil, and he scored three of them with his toe. And I just wonder how many coaches yeah, in the yeah. US and in England would have tried to correct that technique of him using yeah. his toe, which has very little backlift, takes the goalkeeper by, you yeah. know, surprise because there's no backlift and it's a quick, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it just... Yeah. It, it's prescribing solutions for people. You know, it doesn't work, does it? I mean, the best goal yeah. scorers could score off their bum, they're off the shoulder, yeah. you know, off their back or whatever. They just, they knew where to go. I think it was, it was Wayne Gretzky, wasn't it? He said, I know where you... I know where the puck's going. I don't, you know, I want to be where the puck is going to go. Hello, Matthew. Hey, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> he's not, he doesn't look eight anymore, Ian. No, he's not eight anymore. <laughs> he's a big boy. It's interesting because he, he was a really good footballer. He's a, and yeah. the German coach said, Matthew, you may have one more year of cricket and then that's it, you play football. Yeah. And then he did his ACL. So that was the end of the yeah. football career. Um, yeah. But he loves, still loves his football. Yeah. Uh, when, he went cricket? over to England. Yeah, he's a cricketer. Yeah, uh, he played for Queensland and a bit of Australia. But, Wonderful. Um, he's um, but fortunate. I mean, that, that was a fortunate thing about the environment here. It was you could play cricket all year, and he couldn't yeah. play football. We could play cricket through the winter, yeah. which, which was a huge win. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Adam lost my track now. <laughs> yeah. No, that's okay. That's okay. So what you talked about was reframing skill, right? So. Uh, instead of guided discovery, it's guided exploration, you know, yeah. giving players, giving, uh, giving children opportunities to explore and come up with their own answers um, yeah. and their own techniques. Um, now, so just going down this path of reframing skill and skill acquisition, what, you know, so we have people still within, our, within this country and maybe back home as well in England where they'll put down cones and kids are waiting in lines and they're queuing and it's dribble through these cones. And then the coaches get upset that on Saturday they've dribbled yeah. and they've lost the ball because they don't play against cones on Saturday. You know, so, um, yeah. and, then, and then, you know, for example, if it's passing, you and I are opposite each other right now and we're just doing a simple push pass. We're five yards apart, uh, yeah. locked in called dorsiflex. flex, pass the ball with the inside of your foot, you stop it, pass it back. And then yeah. coaches get upset again on a Saturday or Sunday because the pass is picked yeah. off and you and I have just had a, a block practice with no thoughts, no requirement, yeah. no uh, thought requirement, no opposition. Um, and then they expect us to yeah. perform like... Uh, so I've, I've, got, I've got some slides. All right, let's, let's try and get into that then. So. I'll see if I can show you some of this stuff. because I'm going to make... I'm going to make you the presenter, so you then right. you should be able to share your uh, share panel. my screen. So you should be able to share your screen and uh, panel. All right. But so the question is: is as the is the PowerPoint on that screen or it not? Is. It is. It is. Yeah. You can see the PowerPoint. Yeah, I can see your windows. You have a windows up, um, yeah. and I can see can the blue see, window. I don't know whether but the screen I've got because uh, I've got two screens, so I'm not sure yeah. whether it's on your screen or not. Is that on your you. screen? Yeah, I can see it now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, now you may maybe have I'll to just switch that one with your photo, or you might have to enlarge that one. Let okay. me see. Okay. okay, I've enlarged it. I've got it right now. Brilliant. A constraint-led approach to football coaching. You can see that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't see you now, so I'll just <laughs> I'll just talk through I'm this here. if you want. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, you're still here. So um, I I just quickly go through some slides because I think it, it just talks about what we want but um, I think the interesting one for your coaches is what what are your goals um, and the main goal for me I think was trying to create 
um, children who love football. Um, and that's the that's your main goal about anything. And and if you become good, um, you probably like it more. Um, so if we can get the two things going together, that that's um, an important sort of feature of that. Um, just that little line about adaptability. Uh, to be truly skillful is to be adaptable. Uh, is to be truly adaptable. Becoming more skillful becomes becoming more and more adaptable or attuned to the performance environment. And there were just some examples of. You know, Federer can win on every surface, and he's had to do it. He's done it for so many years. He's had to keep adapting um, as people try and counter him, um, and that's sport all the way through, isn't it? Um, and oh, hang on, sorry. Uh, let's see if this works. So I was just thinking about adaptability in football and where it comes from. I just love this—the idea of street football. Yeah. Cantona, I love this. I love these Nike yeah. commercials. Yeah, we can't hear the sound, but we can see the we can see. But uh, yeah. I can share this Henri in the background. Yeah, Joga Bonito. Yeah, what a legend Cantona was. Hey, Doctor Renshaw. Yeah, legend, absolute genius. <laughs> I don't know. Forrest had some geniuses too. To be fair. It's this goal at the end that I think is all about adaptability. You just find a way of solving the problem. And this is how important the environment is in shaping your adaptability, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There. Genius. TH14. Yeah. I'll just go on. Um, so th this idea of adaptability comes about from the environment you design. I just um, I did some work up in Canada um, with, with the women's team up there a few years ago and, and Simon, a lovely guy, Simon Eady, I think, is a goalkeeping coach. He's very protective of his goalkeepers. <laughs> so we found <laughs> this picture and I said, here's your goal. You know, this is you know, it's quite a nice idea. We'll, we'll just protect them. But obviously we don't. We're not. That's a danger. But um, See, coaching isn't easy. How do you challenge all your players? How do you deal with motivation, behavior? What What about the, the uh, problem of equal game time and equal attention, et cetera, et cetera? So that was just something I was just thinking that it's, it's not easy. It's not easy, this at all. Um, and then this is really important questions for you, for you I guess, as a the coordinator, but also for your teams. I think I said to you, you know, the German, we want to win, but we want to yeah. develop. In, in the end, it was really about development. And it was about, you know, what is your role as a, as a coach is to help every player get as good as they can, isn't it? Um, so I had just a few. I think the point at the bottom there, talent ID is very, very difficult. Um, yeah. Trying to select players before they're grown is next to impossible. And well, the, the key age around 14 is when they're growing the most. And I had a, an, an experience where I had to put players forward for a, a rep team. Um, and I picked five, put them forward. They didn't call the players then for about three months. And by the time they called them, one of the a player that was not in the five um, was the best player. Yeah. And I said, I wish I could do it now. I'd put you in. And he, his dad, dad rang me that night and says, well, thanks for what you're saying. Is there any chance we could get him in? Um, and we did. And he got in and he was first pick. But the interesting thing is when we did the selection, he was in the middle of a growth spurt. Yeah. So he'd grown about three inches in three weeks. Um, so all his energy was going into growing, not in being able to run up and down the football field. Yeah. Um, and that, well, that but, bottom bit of him. Sorry, Karen. Well, even at the NFL draft, that's grown men at 21, 22. Yeah. They don't get that right, right? Tom yeah. Brady, I think, yeah. went as like 68 or something in the draft pick, and look yeah. how many Super Bowls he's won. <laughs> yeah, and it, yeah. Uh, we did some. We wrote a piece on that in a paper on brain training. I think you know they they, they give them a cognitive test, and then the quarterbacks are obviously the most intelligent, and the, the yeah. two and three. I think he might have been one of them. But, two or three of the greatest quarterbacks of all time got the lowest score. So what's it got to do yeah. with being a quarterback, I guess, is yeah. the, the idea of that, isn't it? Um, so let me just move on. So here's your cones. So here's your traditional approach. And um, 
so what this develops you so this is some work like we've got the students to do to to look at what this looks like in terms of the adaptability it creates something um, but where is your attention as you yeah. dribbling around the cones it's it's at the cone well in a game it, it doesn't want to be there and my joke with the students is always a problem if the cones win you know, if yeah. the <laughs> um, but you can see here it, it's it's very easy to organize um, it's you can manage it the, the kids are you know well behaved sort of you know um, so that's what you get from this sort of traditional approach isn't it yeah um, and sorry i'll just go back you've got another picture on there i think i and then, and then this this is the other one you know like learning to pass a ball by passing and follow well why you know <laughs> yeah so there's no decision making it's tedious beyond belief but it's controlled isn't it it's it looks organized and so on and yeah. so on but it got very little to do with the game um and, they, and there's your transfer issue isn't it from what you were yeah. saying is how, how does Absolutely. that transfer to the game and i think i love this quote from horst vine who, who did a lot of some great books you probably got them yeah um, too much drill will kill the young players innate potential learning takes place the best when the coach is able to let the players make the decisions um, so we've got to develop games that where they can make the decisions and just going back to the dribbling piece uh, not my as an englishman not my favorite player <laughs> of all time as you you will agree but um this ian rush picked up when he played with him in italy had the knack of being able to run with the ball and never look at it instead his eyes were used for seeing tackles so he'd be able to ride them with ease well how is dribbling round cones going to help you develop that ability um so we want we sort of moved into this idea of more constraint-led coaching which is more hands-off but just emphasize there it's not hands-free um where we guide discovery and tgfu sits for me is is a useful tool within constraints yeah. but we without going into the theory um we use some some basic principles of, of, of ecology um and i'll just put this on very briefly but this is the idea of self-organization that there's nobody here controlling these each of the the starlings in this picture but somehow they managed to coordinate to do you know achieve what they're trying to achieve i guess um, so it's a principle called self-organization within within uh, ecological dynamics and we use these principles in our own coaching so i need to come out of it so you asked the question before could this could messi have developed in england um and i put this usually use this little video and go i don't think this goal would have been scored by an englishman an australian or a new zealander so you can tell me whether an american could do this <laughs> Amazing goal. Yeah, Zlatan. Yeah, and um, I always said in, in England, the parent would have screamed at him about five minutes before that, that you must pass and you're being selfish and it's not a yeah. team, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that is the bit that breaks the game open, isn't it? So this, this idea of self-organization under constraints. And I put this up a bit facetiously, but um, the key coaching tool, I think, is the coffee cart. Um, and put it at the other side of the field and, and let the parents go and get a coffee and get yeah. out of the way um, and let the kids play and let the kids learn um, so that's within their setup appropriate challenges observe more talk less ask questions don't give them the answers um, so you're guiding discovery in that um, i'll just i'll skip over that but um because it's quite long but here's here's a really good example of, of how you design environments to create self-organization and i'll show you the, the this picture on the left which is um, taken from a scandinavian underground which is about fun theory and how they the interesting thing is look at how they design the environment to invite the um, the travelers 
to behave in specific ways. And then I'll show you how we use that idea in, in our, our work. So I just put this on first. Brilliant. Um, so what you're doing here is you're providing what we, the word we use is affordances. You invite, you use features of the environment to invite people to behave in, in particular ways that you want them to. You don't force them to, nobody's forced them to go up the stairs, but the environment invites them to go up the stairs. And we, we use a, a similar principle in our, in our coaching. So um, this activity I'll just show you here. Um, is something that we we use for dribbling but also for passing and australians are they prefer to pass with their hands than with their feet so <laughs> um but you'll see that when i put it on let me just put it on and i'll talk to it they you can't really see it on there because it's a bit messy but there are three squares that are connected by bridges and you start on the outside and you have to get across um through each square and back to where you start so um, they're allowed to pass it in any way they want. I'm not sure um, whether this is very clear on this. I'll maybe pick the no, wrong it's video. Clear. No, it's it? clear. Um, yeah, yeah, you can see. You can see that nobody tells them how to pass um, and nobody gives them the strategy. They just, in pairs, they've got to work out the quickest way to get from where they are th through the, the first square and there are gates around the edge of each square um, and then across the bridge and so on and so on. So wasn't the best video i thought i picked a good video um but it, it really emphasized some are throwing it over the top some are bouncing it some are rolling it etc etc but um hello. the this is a model that we use this idea that the individual the environment the task all interact the constraints the boundaries shape the um the way that somebody tries to play um so how far you can kick a ball will obviously depend on the way that you, you try and play the game related to the size of the pitch, which would be a task constraint, or the size of the goals. And the, the interesting one, pitch size is the time to tackle, I think. You know, how long do you get the ball before you get clattered? Yeah. Um, which can change the whole idea of perception and action. Um, so all of these factors interact to shape the way that an individual plays, but also um, a team can play. Obviously, if you look at individual and put team in there, um, that would shape the way that they play it. So you certainly, if you want to play a high pressing game, but five of your players are completely unfit, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, and what you can do then as a coach is you can manipulate those constraints. So it's the easiest one to do is manipulate task constraints, which is what we do all the time. But you can also manipulate environmental constraints if you're a little bit creative. You know, so you, know, you could go and play on the beach or you could change the length of the grass or 
whatever. Um, and in terms of stuff like kicking power, it, it, obviously growth is a huge issue about how long your levers are. Um, but also the rules within the game can you can help develop reading the game by manipulating rules and so on and so on. Um, I'll just quickly flick through these and then um, one of the key things I did is practice need to be representative and this again we see a lot of practice without opponents and in basketball people do a lot of practice in shooting without a defender in front of them but if you put a defender there um, let's see if you put a defender there um, and you look at all these different types of shots um, you get these differences so you get a higher jump you get a faster release you get a higher arc and you can increase the adaptability or increase the variability um, as colleague Adam Gorman did this research um, so if you think about that if you're learning to dribble with an opponent in front of you rather than a cone or nothing you, you're going to get a different outcome so you'll get an outcome you'll get some technical skill but it's not going to be technical skill that will hold up um under under pressure you know like when do i need to do my trick well i've got to engage the defender to to sell it to him to then go the other way but by practicing this without a defender i don't learn to learn when to do it i guess yeah um this is something adam did um this is from a video he used the swiss ball to try and get them to be adaptable so he just wobbled his about and they, they had to come in, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, they came in and, and had to attack, relatively simple, but they really couldn't adapt to a lot of them. And these were elite level players, um, or Australian level anyway. Okay, so you, you're trying to make practice real. So whenever you're doing anything, you, if you close your eyes and say, well, could this be the game? If it's not, why are you doing it? So you, if you ask yourself, um, does it look and feel like the real thing? Um, if it doesn't, why am I doing it? Uh, it's not going to transfer if it doesn't look and feel like the real game. So even if you go to a 1v1 or, you know, is there an element of the game that this is replicating? And, and that's a key principle to, to sort of ask yourself. Um, we do a lot of idea around focusing on outcome rather than on the movement. And that seems to shape the movements better by um, having an external focus of attention. So, if you, well, interesting one night, um, I played a game where um, I took over for coaching for somebody, but we had uh, four goals, you know, the old four goal one, but only one goalkeeper. Um, and he had to keep running back and forward between each goal. Well, it was interesting then that the, the attack got their head up and kept trying to move it around to where the goalkeeper was it wasn't um, so it, it really made the, the play spread out beautifully you know um and they, it was pretty good fun and, and massively high level of fitness by the way <laughs> by doing that as well so the keeper, the keeper it, never ran so much in his life <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a shock yeah. um but good fun you know like good fun with it as well um but this external focus of attention is something we've we've done a lot of work on and seems to work pretty well um it, it just emerged yeah subconscious level of control allows the learner to solve it um we talk a lot about questioning um encourage problems to problem solve and players to problem solve put the responsibility on the player that sounds like a lot of the stuff that that your your board are working towards um, yeah. But when you want them to answer the question, do it on the field, not to you, because they'll tell you what you want, what to hear, but I want you to show me that you can do it um, as well. Um, sort of the couple of final ones, um, we want to be in the green rather than in the red, um, so that you can encourage your, your coaches to do more exploration, high levels of variability, which, which results in more adaptability, game-like activities, and then individualize it rather than on the red side which is uh, more of a traditional approach and then um, here's the slide i was talking about in terms of search for functional solutions and that the functional which means it works um, and you've got to understand that that's going to be at the level of what the child has got at that moment in time so if you ask him to do something that's impossible if you just set him up for failure and often if we want it to look in a particular way, we base that on an adult model that they, they can't do. Um, so a few little pointers down the side there, we, 
reframe failure mistakes as exploration, allow time and space, allow them to explore, um, add in constraints to, to shape the behaviors that you, you want to, and so on and so on. So um, there's a book, <laughs> if anybody wants to buy it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that that's the summary of the game that, um, that I was talking about earlier. The 4v4, yeah. The journal, yeah. But Brilliant. Anyway, there's, that's a quick but, fly through the, the slides, no, no. I guess. That was, that was magic. And uh, the, the Tim Schultz, who actually started Rush Soccer. So Rush Soccer is in, oof, it's in, we're in 40 states, I believe in 30 countries. Tim's on this and he just said he loves this. He loves this. He works, he worked for the Federation as well. So he says, right. thanks very much, Dr. Renshaw. Love it, love uh -huh. it. No um, so we, we'll record this. And then if you would like to send me your presentation as well, and I can share that if okay. that's okay with you. Yeah, um, I'll probably put it in a PDF because the files yeah. will kill it otherwise. Large. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so video. just, I think it's huge there. And we'll come back to the, um, We'll, we'll come back to that 4v4 and we'll share that out so everybody has that and gets an idea of that. Yeah. So what, uh, obviously, you went through with Thorpey and, and mm. uh, you know, just getting the game sense and teaching games for understanding. And then you were fortunate enough to have a PE teacher, head of department that says, you know, come in, bring the new stuff in. Um, so you weren't really, were you, you probably were taught and coached in the traditional way. But not, oh, yeah. but I mean, not, I remember at, yeah. I remember at Leeds doing my FA prelim, you know, three nights yeah. a week, um, over a month or whatever it was. And it was very traditional. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went through all the, the coaching badges for rugby and it was very similar, you know. Um, but my own experience as a teacher made me realize that the drills weren't working, particularly around rugby. And yeah. you know, we'd, 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 I'd look at the books, I'd get the drill, because I didn't know rugby too well. So I'd go, the safety blanket of, of going to drills and then we'd go straight to the game and it wouldn't work, you know. Um, so I learned then you manipulate the constraints and you can get out what you want. So, um, but it's it's really, it's about, for a P teacher it's a challenge because you've got to teach everything. Um, whereas if you're at one sport, you really ought to know that sport. <laughs> yeah. There's the big bunker at Loughborough said, actually, you're a professional as a PE teacher, you should know the sports. You know, and if you can't, then learn, you go away and find out. Um, so, no, I, I mean, I, I certainly coached in a mixed way. I, I did a lot of badminton, so, um, and I knew badminton pretty well, and, and Rod had taught us TGFU three years in badminton. Um, so I used that a lot yeah. within my coaching. Um, but then with the, with the football, I've always used constraints since then. Yeah. Um, since. since and then and the same with cricket, really. Yeah. Now there's a, there's, a move, there's a movement, there's a movement now to call it affordance led as opposed to constraints, right? Um, language. Yeah, and, I know Stu, Stu worries about the word affordance because it sounds complicated, but yeah. I, I always think if you, you know, for the volunteer it's probably hard, but if you're keen to learn, you've got to learn the language. You know, if I was yeah. teaching you chemistry and we said, well, we're not going to use the word organic because it's too hard, Yeah. you know, that would be stupid. So we, we need to get a framework so everybody knows what each other is talking about. So at least you can read it. And and I, I think that was our goal in the latest book is to, to try and make that language accessible for coaches yeah, uh, and for teachers and, and therefore give real practical examples about what we mean by an affordance or what we mean by a constraint. A constraint, yeah. Uh, no, and we've in the, in, in the Sorry, and in the book we've we've sort of put a bridging chap, a couple of bridging chapters where we're trying to link the theory to the practice to give people a framework of how you would how you would develop it, and how you would you know devise your own sessions. Um, yeah, I was going to ask where could people get the book, Doctor um, Renshaw? Well, I think there's two left on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so only two. I think Amazon, Amazon or Routledge. Apparently, it's gone pretty well, which is very nice to hear. Yeah. Um, I think we were fifth in the world at one stage a month ago for coaching books, which is Fantastic. remarkable for an academic, well, you know, allegedly academic. Um, but you can get it on through Amazon or whatever, book depository, whatever you, you, know, you do. I'll, uh, I'll send you my address so I can get a signed one. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you talked a little bit and you had an external focus, right? Uh, you yeah. talked about external focus. So I just interviewed with um, Aubrey, Aubrey, I can't, Aubrey Watts from the uh, United States Olympic and uh, Paralympic Committee. And they right. talked about using external cues versus internal cues. Now, when you say external focus of attention, is, yeah. is that... Is that what you're referencing? Is that the yeah. external? So yeah. there's a couple of examples that are relatively straightforward. So there was a, a very famous cricketer in Australia called Bradman, who was the greatest of all time. Uh, and his coaching advice, tell him what you want them to do, not how to do it. You know, so I want you to hit the ball here. I want you to hit the ball there. I want you to drop it. In, you know. So you don't tell them how to do it, but you tell them what you want them to do. And the, the best example from rugby, which you could probably find, is, is Johnny Wilkinson, um, who, when he got too technical, would kick the ball to Doris, who was an old lady sat in the stand behind the post. So all he did was try and kick the ball to Doris. Um, okay. and, and the other one was, it was this, yeah, this vision of a, a, a mouth that was laughing at him every time he missed a kick. Um, and that mouth was sat behind the door. So the only way to shut the mouth up was to kick the ball into it. <laughs> so he had this external focus of attention that stopped him, you know, worrying about where his foot was and his heel was and, uh, and then everything organized from that. Um, but there's a famous, few famous cricketers who sang as their ball, the run into ball, you know, just to quieten the, you know, like, whoops, not worrying about where your elbow is and where your foot is. They just sang, yeah. you know, they ran into balls. I think, um, who was his name? Uh, one of the England players. He's the best coach he ever had was Dolly Parton, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's just singing out. Um, just singing Dolly songs. <laughs> Blonde-haired Yorkshireman, I can't remember his name. Oh, Freddie Flintoff? No, no, no. no. Yorkshireman. Um, oh, I forgot his name. Little fat lad. <laughs> um... Anyway, it's come back to me, maybe. Yeah. Uh, in Glen McGrath, when I, I sing when I win, so I call it sing when you're winning, you know, like okay. win when you're singing. Yeah. Sing when you're winning, not win when you're singing. You know, I've played against cricketers who sing while they're batting, you know. Like yeah. West Indians, you know, one of them, you're not, you're not singing today, Lambie. No, man, I got the bowler's rhythm. I don't need to sing today, you know. Great. That's good news for us, you know. Um, yeah. So it, it's that that external focus of, is sort of shaping. Right? So if you are a golf coach, you'd look at the shape of the ball, you know, like look at the shape of the flight that you're yeah. making and then link that to how it felt, you know. Um, and a lot of practice then is about exploration. So I want to hit one with a draw, one with a slice, one straight, um, that sort of thing. So it might be, you know, you, you could be on a touch line, right? I want you to bend it around the, the post and hit the back post, you know, from the inside or the outside or yeah. I want you to lob, lob it over the top and uh, just you know is that they were kicking games do it like that yeah or what yeah. spin could you create on the ball you know like how, how do you create back spin if you're trying to chip the ball or whatever yeah so how do we get the ball going that way so you might get a ball with different panels that you know, emphasizes you that so you can really see it so you might start off just throwing it up kick it to yourself and get it going backwards right now can you put top spin on it or whatever what happens to side spin so and, and that's where you add the constraint of the ball type to make it obvious so you know of, of what you're doing to exaggerate it which is a tgfu principle obviously yeah yeah as well for yeah. those that don't know tgfu is teaching games for understanding as well yeah, so. sorry yeah, that's okay, Dr. Renshaw. Dr. Renshaw, we have a question from Neil McNabb out of Atlanta. He says, um, we just spoke about the play practice play methodology that yeah. the U.S. Soccer Federation is using right now. Um, and he asks, what is your opinion of that? I think it came from a guy called Alan Launder, who was an Australian who was very closely connected to uh, Bunker and Thorpe. And um, without being rude, I think it's just TGFU in another name. Yeah. Biggest game is it's TGFU. It's the same concepts, the same ideas, just packaged a little bit differently. Yeah, and Neil, we can chat offline about that and uh, why yeah. the Federation's gone to that um, as well. But um, if, if there's any questions for Dr. Renshaw, we, we're running close on time and I want to be sensitive to his time as well. 
Um, just type them in and we'll get them in. But uh, Dr. Renshaw, I think we need a part two and a part three um, <laughs> when you're available. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we'll, we'll share your presentation and uh, also where they can get the book on Amazon. And uh, yeah. we'll just finish up with a few one-worders, right? So yeah, I'll ask you yeah. a question and you've got well, some- I, I couldn't get my head around this when you were asking yeah. me this. Yeah. So, if, so I, I can ask you a question and you get a one-word answer. So for example, right. if I say football, your one-word yeah. one answer is? Nottingham Forest. <laughs> is forest. That two? That's, no, that works. Forest. Nottingham Forest works. <laughs> If I say Aussie rules football, uh, madness, madness, rugby, brutal, brutal cricket, uh, nuanced, nuanced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the answer was nuanced too, but that's good. Yeah. England, uh, lose, <laughs> lose. <laughs> Australia. I'm flattered in his team. Yeah, well, no. always let you down. No, <laughs> Tim Arnold, one word. Sorry. Yeah. Australia. Uh, hot. Hot. Family. Yeah, important. Important. Yeah, brilliant. And then uh, one was uh, uh, constant or block practice. Neither. Neither. <laughs> neither. Neither, neither. Tomato, tomato. And then the final one is is uh, affordance-led approach. Uh, yeah. Yes. I would have yeah. also said vital, critical. Yeah, right? yeah. So. I think the, the thing is, is that often we avoid this discussion in the last year or so, is we call it a constraint-led approach, but we've forgotten the, the bit that goes with that, which is self-organization. Yeah. So it's, we could just as easily call it the self-organization approach under constraints, but the, and the affordances are just the features of the environment. So this is the bit where you bring ecological psychology into dynamic systems together. So affordances fit within the, the model of the individual and environment mutuality, the environment shapes the behavior. So if you look at any other stuff on Pallada and, you know, there's, there's a great documentary actually from out of the States called Doing It in the Park, which is about basketball, but street basketball, but being the true academy, you know, the true sort of place where players get the resilience, the skill, the adaptability um, to become brilliant basketball players. I watched it on a play and it was superb, and you know, but, but it's the same principle as the, the street football in, in Brazil. Um, backyard cricket in Australia, you know, and, and that's where the adaptability, you know, our jumpers for goalpost stuff in England when you're a kid. Yeah, uh, yeah, not enough of that. that. Yeah, the affordances of the environment shape yeah. what abilities people develop. You know, I think even the, you know, the cage football in London, you know, on the poorer estates of London is where the players are coming out of now. You know, um, I, I, I was talking to a very eminent footballer who won't let his son go anywhere near an academy because he said he will stifle them. Yeah. You know, in, in Scotland, actually, he said, and he was an international. He said, it killed me. He said, I'm not letting it kill my kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which was interesting. No, it's, it's, it's funny, right? Um, and then, you know, I did, a, I started a program maybe 15 years ago and we had, it was the FA, uh, the FA, it was the skills challenge. So it was yeah. the FA Coke yeah. skills challenge. And then the other yeah. one was a, a free play. And yeah. the parents would sign up their children for the Coca-Cola skills challenge, but the free play was not as busy, you know, yeah. we would have. Yeah. And then eventually Design. we flipped the script and we managed to get so many for the, uh, for the free play yeah. and, and stuff like that. So we have one yeah. final question, uh, yeah. Dr. Renshaw, um, but, before I ask that question, just want to say thank you for your time and yeah, thanks thank for you. joining thanks us for and sharing me. your knowledge and passion. So the question comes from German Camilo Castandenda Chala, and he said, Dr. Renshaw, do you think the opposition for those players who are just getting started, for example, four years old in the game would be ideal? Should we allow them to get the contact with the ball without the opposition? Um, I think, you know, I, I didn't show you on the video, but... Um, the, the passing game I do on 
they do on their own as well. So it's a dribbling game where they've got to dribble around all the three boxes. Um, I've got a master student who are looking at the, the types of touches and the way that you run with the ball. So games like that, 1v0, they, it is, there are, there is no opponent, but there could be 20 people all around you and you've got to navigate your way through it. So I think this game has to be appropriate to the level of the, of the child. So yeah. if it's kicking, you, you know, you might, you, it depends on the true level of the beginner, isn't it? So if you're yeah. taking your, your son or daughter out you know, you kick them back and forward to each other and you can play games like that. Um, you need to be able to kick a ball and you need to be able to run with a ball. Yeah. Okay, so you, they they can be just as much games as, as having an opponent in and you can challenge them. So, as I said, we used to play a game one with you, right foot, left foot, inside right foot, outside right foot, pass it here, pass it there. And then we would play, you know, I, I'd throw it in and he'd have to, cut you know do a bicycle kick and smack it in the goal and yeah. do it from both sides in different angles so you can Head. make the game fun headers and um, volleys without headers and volleys you know yeah. like so it was one way you, you know you let with you're pretending you've got a defender up your backside you roll it in he flicks it over his head runs around and smashes it into the goal you know I remember doing that loving it you know like just flicking it over the defender run around smack it into especially if you've got a net that goes phew, yeah. you know when you hit the ball down the net um, so there's a mixture isn't there but Absolutely. there's times to play you can play a 1v0 game against the wall and you can challenge yourself so you can you know you, 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 we called it wally when i was a kid you know like yeah. you could have one touch you could have two touch you could gotta knock it up control it on your chest hit it down you can make all those games up um yeah. if you've got nobody there to play with but if you have then great play with them but don't go too serious too early, especially yeah. for you know. No, six. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Indeed, that should be a, a physical literacy introduction to moving with the ball and exploring on just, their own terms. Yeah. Just let them yeah. throw the ball, kick the ball. Just, yeah. yeah, just play them, just run with the ball. You know, like yeah. chase when they're two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're running with the ball. I'm coming after you. You know, yeah. they're running with the ball. They're learning that. And use different size balls, of course, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Tennis balls, the medicine balls, yeah. the, you know. I'm not sure about the medicine ball, but tennis balls. Well, I, meant, I meant the yoga ball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The yeah. yoga ball. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I remember, right. I, and you must have had the same way growing up as well, Ian, when you the, we'd get the, the ball that was a fiver, that was like the Wembley Trophy that stung like yeah. that. And then, the, and then there was the 99p ball that would move all over the place, the Tesco yeah. ball, so. It's really interesting, right. isn't it? Because a lot of the balls seem to behave like that at the elite level now. Like yeah. when they change the ball, the goal is having to deal with that. Um, maybe that's what you bring that in as training to get them yeah. used to the ball. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. So, all right. Well, listen, thanks a lot, Dr. Renshaw. Right. I'll be in touch by right. email. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Um, we were lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Renshaw and have lots of his time. So. Enjoy the summer, stay warm, and I hope you get that rain soon, Dr. Renshaw. Okay, thanks. Thanks very okay. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. -bye. bye.